Thanks for joining us. I think you're on mute at the moment. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hello. Oh yes. Perfect. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, do you want to do the introduction, Hamza, and then I'll go from there? Uh, yeah. So Niha will do the in introduction. Uh, oh. Should we give it a few minutes uh, for more people to join, or are you happy to Up start to now? We'll give it a few more minutes. Can we get started? Because um, I need to shoot off uh, yep. at around eight ish, if that's okay. Of course, no yeah. We'll start Thanks. off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Mind the Bleep webinar in our FY1 Survivor Guide 10 part series. Today's talk breaks down the FY1 contract and it's going to be delivered by Dr. Sarah Asher, who's actually in the unique position of being a former accountant. Um, she's also head of surgery, finance, and QI at Mind the Bleep. Just a reminder that the webinar will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Please remember to ask any questions and we'll make sure to answer them at the end. Um, remember, you can also sign up for free weekly webinars. I'll post the link for that in the chat box. And you can also um, fill in the feedback forms at the end for a certificate. And again, I'll post the link for that in the chat box. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Syra. Thank you so much, Nihal. Um, so this evening, I'm going to go through some basics about the contract. Um, as you can imagine, con the contract is boring. Um, it's a dry read, but I will highlight some important things that you need to look out for. Um, and then I'll also direct you to where to find information for yourselves when, um, so you don't have to sit here and listen to all of it from me. So let me get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, hang on. Take myself of it. This always happens, doesn't it? Okay. I hate these, but here we go. I won't be able to see you in a bit. There we go. If you have anything, any questions, pop them in the chat, and I'm sure Nihal or Hamza will ask me the questions if I need them. So first, I'm just going to quickly run through some bits that I've pulled out of the of um, the contract and then um, I'll show you a few important things that you might want to look out for, for yourselves okay uh, Nihal or Hamza can you confirm if you can see my screen oh uh, yeah we can see the screen excellent and is it moving for you there it is yeah lovely okay so we're going to talk about the contract um, uh, Nihal very kindly uh, introduced me so we'll move on from there one thing I wanted to raise with you before I moved on to anything else is about um, the doctor's pay erosion so over the last 10 years our pay has been cut by in real terms by 22.4 percent what this basically means is that because inflation has been rising higher and quicker than our pay the buying power of each pound of money that we earn has gone down so in real terms, i.e. the amount that we can buy as a result of our earnings has gone down as well. If you go to my Instagram page, at the finance medic, um, there's a post that describes that very carefully in detail so you can understand what it means. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because 
there's been some, a movement in trying to get our pay back to what it should be. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, not we, me personally, but you, there's the doctor's vote and having just voted a lot of them into the BMA council, their only goal is to restore our pay. And so I'd like you, if you could, to look at those um, and just find out a bit more about the devaluation of our profession so that you can fight for your pay um, as well. Moving on to the junior doctor contract. So I'm going to be talking about the junior doctor contract in England. There's actually different contracts in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. They're on the old contract. Um, if need be, I can also do one for the old contract, but I'll focus on the England one for now. The new contract, so each time you rotate, you get a new contract from your employer. So for example, at the moment, I'm in Thames Valley Deanery for my foundation training. But for my first year of foundation training, I'm under Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust. And so I got a one year contract from them. And next, I'm at Oxford University's Hospitals Trust. So I'll be getting a new contract, hopefully soon, um, from them as well. So we get a new contract every time we rotate to a new employer. Sometimes there are certain deaneries that have a lead employer where they've got an agreement between different trusts that only one of the trusts will administer the contract and sub you out to different trusts rather than you having to get a new contract each time. But it's very individual. And I, I don't know which ones do which. I know the one I um, has a separate contracts. So the first thing is your contract will outline your job description and it should provide you an accurate picture of the hours that you will work and what your rotor looks like. Ideally, you should have your rotor six weeks before starting. When I started, mine was two weeks before I started. And, and even though it's part of the contract, it's a contractual agreement, a lot of trusts still don't get the rotors out six weeks before starting. Next, um, there were some little bits I wanted to highlight about the contract. So basically, if you choose to terminate your contract or your trust ter terminates your contract with you, these are the notice periods, so one month if you're an FY1, that they have to give you and you have to give them. There will be some variations in the contract, however, these are very rare because each variation has to be agreed by the junior doctors forum um, and the local junior doctors, um, excuse me, sorry, my dog wants to jump up, excuse me. So, because it has to be agreed by each forum, there's very little chance of variability unless there's something special that needs doing or you've requested something special. And I'll, I'll show you how to tell whether there are variations or not in your contract in a moment. Next is FY1 shadowing. So, every trust is actually, that provides a foundation training program um, is actually contractually obliged to pay you at least four days worth of shadowing for FY1 at an FY1 basic salary rate and it prescribes exactly how it should be calculated and so you should cal calculated the hours undertaken in a four day shadowing period so 32 hours or four fifths of the full 40 hours and it should be calculated like that. If you've been given a shadowing period and that's not, not how your pay is being calculated you should contact the BMA or at least the BMA rep for your local region. And then next is pay. So I'm assuming um, a lot of you are FY1s. Um, forgive me if you're um, a different grade. Uh, you can find the additional information on the pay circulars. All you have to do is Google 2223 doctor's pay circular and the PDF will come up. But basically the FY1 salary from this tax year onwards is 29,384 for a 40 hour week. We then get additional pay for weekends, for nights, and for any hours worked over those 40 hours. You can then have your contract before you sign it checked by the BMA. But I'm just going to give you some tips on what you can do before you do that in case you don't want to. So first I'll talk about the weekend allowance. So the weekend allowance is based on your rotor of how often you work on the weekends. Um, contractually, they encourage employers not to have you any more than one in three weekends. But um, 
I, for example, in my um, contract, I was working between one and three and between one and four weekends. So there were three occasions where it was on one and three, and then on the fourth one, it was one and four. But I still got paid seven and a half, despite most of my weekends being one and three. So it's a bit weird that how they've sort of split this where it's less than one in two and greater or equal to one in three, where I had equal to one in three. But because not all of my my weekends were one in three, one of them was one in four, they were able to pay me seven and a half percent premium rather than a 10 percent premium. I tried arguing it, but unfortunately, they that they managed to do it that way because of just how vague that um, that rule is the the contract isn't perfect basically um, so you then get enhanced hours so this is 37% of any time that you work between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. any day of the week however if you have night shifts and they start they shouldn't start any earlier than 8 o'clock at night um, and they shouldn't start any later than 2359 so 1159 they last at least eight hours then you should get 37% of your hourly basic pay for all of it, up until 10 o'clock that day. So for example, on my medical nights, I worked from 9 p.m. to um, 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m. And so all of that was paid at 37 37%, even though it says here that it's up to 7 o'clock in the morning. But actually, because it was that night shift where it was at least eight hours long, it was later than 8 o'clock, but earlier than 11.59, and it was up to 10 o'clock on the next day, I got 37% for all of those hours. So that's your night premium. Working time regulations. I get asked about this a lot. And in your contract, you're not, you're not um, told to opt out of it. No one's really forced to opt out of it. Um, you can voluntarily opt out of it. I, you know, I don't think you should have to just because it does work out um, so it says here that it's an average weekly limit of 48 so some some week there was one week I worked 68 hours and then another week where I worked 32 hours and so over time as long as it works out at 48 hours you I have fit you fit within the working time regulations not only that it should be a maximum average of 56 hours a week, a maximum of 72 hours over 168 period. So it's not just the 48 hours. So you might find there are some weeks where you're working 68, 69 hours, and um, you'll find that over the rotor, it will even out to 48 hours. And I'll show you how they figure it out in a moment. Next, um, breaks. So, uh, it, this is contractual. If you're working at least five hours, so your normal working day, you get at least one 30-minute break. If you're working more than nine hours, so a long day is usually um, not, uh, 12 hours, then you get an, another 30 minutes or an hour overall. And if you're working nights, which is over 12 hours, you get another 30 minutes, so an hour and a half break. And so just make sure that you're taking those breaks. You're entitled to take Half an hour on a normal working day, that is less than nine hours. An hour split up, ideally, for anything that's over nine hours. And then on a night shift, it's an hour and a half. That's not done yet. That's just I wanted to pick on certain things. Because I wanted to show you, first of all, um, this is the model contract page. It's just loading, there with me. And basically, you can use this link here to download a copy of the model contract, which I have here. And my contract from Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust is identical to this model contract. So I really didn't even have to get the BMA to look at my contract. I did, and it was, it, it, it was fine, it was compliant. But basically, the trust just used this contract. So if you download this, um, I'm going to pop the link in the chat now. If you download this and check your contract against it, and it absolutely matches, then you don't actually need um, 
to have your contract checked because it's got the model contract. Um, and mine was identical, like I said. The next thing I wanted to show you is a BMA handbook on the contract, which is where I got a lot of my information from. So this is the BMA handbook. It's the latest copy. Let me just give you the link again. Um, let's get back so I can show you what that is. Oop, nope, that's here. Nope. Where are we? There we are. Okay. So this will give you all the contractual requirements based under the junior doctor contract. There are a lot of things. So for example, here, pay, um, you might be interested in the contracts of employment, work scheduling, hours of work, exception reporting. Um, all of this is really well explained in this handbook. I found it really, really useful. Um, so did you know that contractually, trusts are meant to reimburse you for your moving costs? And so you'll be able to find the relocation cost form um, for wherever you're moving. So you should absolutely look for that. There was one thing I wanted you to see. Let me just go back to the top. Not here. Yeah, hours of work. There we go. So your rotor should meet these requirements here. You should have a minimum of 11 hours continuous rest in every 24 hour period. Um, our long days on medicine were 13 hours long. So they, they literally squeezed right up to that limit. Um, a minimum rest break of 20 minutes every six hours. This is actually really tough, um, especially for doctors because our rest breaks are paid and so they're less rigid than nurses breaks that aren't paid so when nurses take a break that their, their breaks aren't paid so they they are very rigid about them they take turns and they they tend not to skip their breaks some unfortunately do when things are really really busy but for doctors because they're paid there's this expectation that we should kind of be doing stuff in our breaks and and stuff but we're moving more and more towards a culture of making sure you take at least 20 minutes. It does make a big difference. Um, things are stupidly busy and burnout is real and you need to look after yourself. So if you need to sort of step away for 20 minutes, it's going to be fine. Um, and it is absolutely important for you to look after yourself. Um, so all of these are set out um, in the contract and then I thought it might be useful for you to actually see my work schedule so um, here's a copy of my work schedule there's my name training program where it all sets out it sets out the site all my important people it sets out the training requirements which are all contractual, so you have to meet these. These are the mandatory training. And this is the biggie. This is the important thing. So I wanted to show you this because this is what's going to dictate how you can take leave. And so what happens is in this normal working day, you can take annual leave on normal working days. On long days, nights, um, on call, which is respiratory, we couldn't take annual leave, so we're only allowed to take them then. Um, you can see my weekends, uh, one in three, there, one in three, one in three, there we go. But even though it was one in three, but there were no instances of it being one in two, um, I got the seven and a half percent premium rather than the 10 percent premium. Um, and then you have your zero days, you have your self-development time, which we are now obliged to have an hour a week. And they, the trusts can set it out anywhere they, they like. So our trust gave us days that were allocated rather than sort of, um, well, it depended really on, on which rotation you were on. So um, my colleagues on hematology, for example, they were given half an hour every morning. 
for self-development time. Um, but unfortunately, that's not really very, you can't get very much done um, in that time. So they did negotiate sort of having half days rather than um, splitting at, it out in that way. So that's what uh, a rotor looks like, everybody's rotor. Um, everybody's rotor will be very similar on the same rotation, but it may vary if they have been, um, their occupational health assigned them to not do nights, um, and uh, if they've been signed not to do certain hours, for example, or certain lengths of shifts, it may vary. So let's go down here. Now this is the important bit, the thing I was telling you about, and this is all the checks to make sure that you're falling within it. So even though I, for example, had a brutal, brutal, um, here, I had a massive stretch of seven days, or here where I was working 9 a.m. till 10 p.m., 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., and the rest of the week was nine to five. It still worked out as an average of 40, 45 hours. So it came under the 48 hour working time directive target. The max weekly hours is under 72. I did have a couple of weeks where I worked 68, 69 hours, but it came under the 72. Max consecutive shifts, seven. I did have seven in a row then. Um, consecutive long shifts, all of that. So these are all the actual main 2016 contractual requirements all in one block. So you know that you've actually, they've actually met their contractual obligations. Here, um, the weekly rest, 24 hours, daily rest, 11. And here, they break down what your equivalent salary for that year would be if you continued on that rotor. So this was my, my acute rotation was before the new tax year. So it was on the old FY1 salary, 28808, before the 2% uplift. I worked an average of an additional 6 hours 15 a week. So if you see here, that's where that 6 hours 15 has come from. And so that was the additional of just my basic pay applied to that 6 hours 15 over the year. Then I had the 7.5% weekend allowance because it was 1 in 3 for most of them. And that's the additional per year. And then this was my night premium. So there were 8 hours um, a week they averaged out. Um, to be that 37 percent and so that's that for the whole year so despite my basic salary being 28,808 because of all the um, on call out of hours night uh, and weekend my annual salary was basically 37,668 and I'd say my rotor was very on call heavy so that was probably the upper end of what someone in FY1 would be earning. The good thing I would really encourage you to do is to share the same way I've shared mine with you. We don't have to hide um, what we're earning because everybody earns the same. We are at nodal points. And it helps to make sure that you're all consistent because it will help you identify if any mistakes have been made. And so I really encourage you to share with each other and uh, discuss if you think there are any discrepancies in your contract. So that was kind of a whistle-stop tour of the more important things. So I thought, let me take some questions. Right, I can see the chat. Are they obliged to offer us a shadowing period or are they obliged to pay us? So, um, they are obliged to pay us, that's a really good question. Um, so I think it would be silly of them not to offer a shadowing period if they're already paying you to do it. Um, so for last year, because it was post-COVID, uh, we got two weeks and that was mandatory um, for them to offer, not mandatory for us to take. Um, but this year and I think all consecutive years will be a minimum of four days paid shadowing. If you don't choose to take it, that's up to you, but they are obliged to offer it. So I hope that answers your question. Do we just email a contract to the BMA rep? Um, so no, you, are, uh, you have to be A, a BMA member, and then B, um, this, I'll just give you the email address for the... Um, 
let me just get you the email address, bear with me. For the BMA, so there's a there's an email address that you email it to, but you have to be a BMA member. But if your contract matches the model contract, which I gave you the um, link for, then you shouldn't need to use the BMA contract checking service. So this is the link to the checking service. Um, so if you are a BMA member, then absolutely check this service out. There we go. Oh, thank you, Hamza. Okay. Um, if you're a member of the BMA, yep, Nihal, thank you, Hamza. Yep. Are relocation costs applicable after you start working, or is it applicable during the graduate to F1 transition period? So you're allowed to um, request it within three months of incurring the cost. So for example, um, after graduating, if you move, I we moved in July, so we had from July, August, September to um, get our costs apply for our costs but say um, I decided that I was half a year in Wickham and half a year at Stoke Mandeville so I was going to move between them then I would still be able to claim relocation costs as long as I claimed within three months of incurring them. I hope that answers that one there. In what circumstances can you claim relocation costs? If you relocate. Um, there are different rules for if you're moving from rental to rental or if you're moving from rental to bought or if you're moving from bought to bought. But um, each trust has its own little rules for them, but they are contractually obliged to provide you with information and to provide you with reimbursement. I know that Scotland doesn't. Just that was something I learned um, when we first moved. Um, Olgina has just said, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, okay, um, so I hope that answers your question for relocation costs. Basically, if you're relocating, if you're moving, and you incur van hire costs, you have to make trips to identify where you're going to live. All of those um, uh, movers, for example, you can claim those costs back. Is there any way to take um, a leave on an... Uh, so... Okay, yep, swaps. So if you want to take leave on a normal, non-normal working day, you have to swap. It's your responsibility to find a swap. Um, so as long as you can swap to someone else who is on a, non, on a normal working day, you can take leave because you've swapped on to a normal working day. So for example, if they've got an on-call shift, you've got an on-call shift, and you've just swapped between the two of you, you still can't take leave because you swapped onto their on-call shift. So it has to be a swap with someone who's on a normal working day so that you can take annual leave on their day. I hope that makes sense. Is it a fix? Is the relocation cost a fixed lump sum or based? It's based on your receipts. So keep receipts for everything. Um, they have an upper limit. So each trust will be slightly different, so just have a look, but they have an upper limit. Um, is the relocation cost a fixed lump sum or based on reimbursement? It's based on receipts. Can you claim every time you get relocated or just to claim once in your whole lifetime? Nope, every time you relocate, um, up to an upper limit. They've got a lifetime upper limit, um, which I think is £8,000, uh, but you can claim as many times as you need, as many times as you incur, as long as you have the evidence. Um, is there a relocation for monthly allowance? No. So there's 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 no um, monthly allowance or subsidised um, subsidised subsidised rental. There's hospital accommodation. It's pretty much similar price to normal private rental. Um, so uh, you know it's up to you whether you do that, but you don't get any additional funding for living costs in that way. Relocation costs can claimed near the end of the FY1 period. Hamza, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to argue with that one. You can claim it three months from incurring it. Be very careful about this. 
because you don't want to get to towards the end of your FY1 period and realize you, you can't claim it because it's past three months. Um, are the breaks discussed earlier in addition to lunch breaks? No, those are your breaks. Um, so the breaks I discussed are just the breaks, full stop. There's no separate lunch breaks or anything like that. You choose when to take your half an hour, which is less than nine hour shift. Um, your second half an hour if it's over nine hours and your third half an hour if you're on nights and it's over 12 hours. Um, can you claim relocation cost if moving location? Okay, we've answered that one. Um, are there similar info somewhere on older contract or the contract in Scon Scotland? Yes, there is. Um, I will need to dig it out for you because I haven't looked myself. Um, if uh, I figure it out, I will update um, our Facebook, so keep an eye out and I'll also update my Instagram, you can have a look on that as well. I've heard that for IMGs we're able to extend our shadowing period to 10 days, is this true? Unfortunately I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think you can negotiate with the trust and it's on an individual basis, so if you want a longer shadowing period to build your confidence, I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to request that and see if they're willing to give it to you. Um, but I think it's very discretionary. I don't think it's mandatory. Okay. Um, BMA checking. What is the name of the YouTube channel? Um, does relocation cost include the cost for commute to different hospitals? Okay, good question. And the answer is, if it is over 17 miles. So if you are within 17 miles, of your first hospital and your second hospital, then you don't get to reclaim. You only reclaim mileage for anything over 17 miles. So I'm going to share my screen again because there's a bit about this on that BMA handbook. Okay. Let's go back to the um, table of contents. Ooh, let me show you. Nope, this is not it. Apologies. There we are. Um, Travelling and other expenses. There we go. Rates of mileage. Okay, so here it's the mileage payable for that journey is subject to maximum allowance, schedule 12, paragraph 15. So I will implore you to read this because I at the moment can't find it, but I know it's 17 miles for me um, and double check what it is for you but there is a limit, unfortunately. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. So we have removal expenses. It should really be in here. Yeah, um, I would look here. Um, I'm not going to look into it right now, but I'm pretty sure it's seven. It was 17 miles for us, um, so have a look on there. Let's go back to you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Kyra, for uh, this talk. It's been very useful. Good. So this is the first event uh, of our, our FY1 survival guide. Um, and Kyra will be joining us for another talk on pay and finances later this month. Uh, our next talk will be on the 2nd of June. Uh, it will be run by Dr. Nihal Ch Chanayan, 
and it will be on preparing for FY1. Uh, don't forget to fill out feedback forms uh, because this is really important for us to know on things we can improve upon. And you also get uh, a certificate of attendance, which you can use for your portfolio as well. Okay. Uh, there's just one more question. If we waive the European Working Time Directive, what are the rules governing our working hours? None. You, you've waived them. So you have waived the right to have any... Uh, check on that. Okay. Um, yep, you've they've given you the contact details for uh, the FY ones. Have how can they? So if you have any questions, pop them in the feedback, and I can answer them. Uh, also, Are keep an eye. Oh, sorry, can let you go. No, no, carry on. Sorry. I was just going to say, keep an eye on the Mind the Bleep uh, Facebook page. Uh, there will be some useful resources on there. Uh, we'll update articles as well. And Kyra's talk will be available to watch again. It will be recorded. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone. Please fill out the feedback form if you have some spare time. It's great for us and we can make our future webinars better. Take care, guys.